So let's say we, I mean, motivated by this, we want to like go even further and try to get a better bound than 1 over 100 ln n using uh, Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, well, in fact, without going all the way, we can try to take the idea of you know, saying like, well, we can understand the expected value of x squared, and we can put a parabola over our step function and get some better bound that way. We can try to do that with like higher degree polynomials, like put a fourth power polynomial above our step function. So let me explain what I mean by that. And uh, to make things nicer, let's switch now to the plus or minus one version of this scenario. So let's switch to analyzing x, the sum of n independent random variables, which are Rademachers, meaning they're plus one or minus one with probability half each. Okay, this WP is with probability. Uh, okay, and let's try to do this picture thing again. So now this thing that we care about is exactly the same as the probability that uh, this new random variable x, its absolute value is at least, uh, again, 10 root ln n standard deviations. And now the standard deviation of this x is root n. Okay, so we're still trying to upper bound this. And, okay, we can do this picture again. Okay, so let's put t root n here in general. Let's put minus t root n here in general. Let's look at the function f, which is 0 down here, then jumps up to 1 out here, and 1 out here. Let's call this f of x. OK, and so this probability is literally equal to the expected value of f of x. f is indicating the event that we care about. And instead of putting a parabola here, let's put like a quartic. OK, so it'll look kind of flatter. I guess it's good because like it's doing like a tighter job of matching f of x in this range, which is frankly the range that the random variable is likely to be in. Uh, so this quartic, I guess, is g of x equals x to the fourth divided by, okay, we need to match up at this point, so I guess it's t to fourth times n squared. Okay, so this is therefore at most expected value of g of x, okay, which is clearly expected value of x to the fourth over, uh, well, t to the fourth n squared. So now you could see if we could somehow compute expected value of x to the fourth, we would get like a nice bound. And uh, if you look at it, you're like, well, I guess I could do it. And so let's do it. Yeah? Uh, can you go over again how you came up with g of x? Oh, yeah. I did, okay, so I used, I mean, I didn't pull out of a hat. I kind of knew something like this would work. So I used some, uh, I guess, some smarts to know this is roughly a good idea. So basically, I wanted a function that was like x to the fourth. But like, I also wanted to like tightly in some sense, upper bound this step function f of x. So I just took x to the fourth divided by some constant where the constant is chosen just so that like g of x and f of x would match up here. So if you plug in t root n here, you get t to the fourth over n, t to the fourth n squared. Thanks. Uh, OK, so let's do it. Uh, I'm going to slightly a drag. And what I'm doing right now is sometimes called the fourth moment method. And you can use it sometimes so, you know, to get better bounds even than Chebyshev when you feel like you can heroically compute expected value of x to the fourth where x is your random variable. But sometimes you've got to do it. In fact, when we study analysis of Boolean functions, I'm going to show you a slicker way to do some of these computations. But I'll do them like in the non-slick way right now. So uh, OK, we're looking at x to the fourth which is sum, i goes from 1 to n, x i to the fourth. And uh, let's do it. Let's expand it out. It's going to be a little bit gross, but here we go. This is sum over i of x i to the fourth. Plus, uh, well, let me just say some terms that look like x i cubed x j. 
And then some terms that look like xi squared, xj squared. And then like some terms that look like xi squared, xj, xk. And then some terms that look like xi, xj, xk, xl. And we can work out the exact coefficients here, but we're going to save time by not fully doing that, and I'll show you why. What we really care about is the expectation of this. So by linear expectation, we can take the expectation of each piece. So this one's easy because xi's are plus or minus 1, right? So xi to the fourth is always 1. So this, is, this term is always n. Okay. Now let's look at these terms. We're going to get something that looks like you know, expected value of xi cubed, xj. And here I'll rely on the fact that uh, these random variables are independent. In fact, I only need pairwise independence for this xi cubed times x, expected value of xj. And now look at expected value of xj. It's 50, 50, plus or minus 1. So this expectation is 0. Actually, so is this expectation, but never mind. I'll just remember this fact. And that's good, because all these terms will have expectation 0. So we don't even need to count them. So it's all going to go to 0. Let's go back to this one. Uh, this one, similar story, right? Expectation of xi squared xj, xk, by independence, you can write it like this, xj, xk. OK, and the expectation of xj is 0, expectation of xk is 0, so this term is extra 0. And all these terms will also be 0, because there's at least one x here to the power of 1. Great, so a lot of stuff drops out. That's nice. The only thing we have left to do is this. So, okay, well, I guess xi squared, xj squared, because xi and xj are always plus or minus 1. This is just 1. Okay, so the contribution here, we just have to count the number of terms. There's nothing else to do. So we now need combinatorics. I will just look at my paper. Uh, I guess the number of terms like this is n choose 2 times 4 choose 2. Right, because you've got to choose two i's and j's out of the n, but also there's like, for the fourth ways you can expand this out, there's four choose two ways of arranging them. Anyway, it's this. Good, so just this term and this term survived, which was convenient. This is. Um, 3n squared minus 3n. OK, so in conclusion, with some annoying work, we deduce that the expected value of x to the fourth is 3n squared minus 2n, I guess. OK, let's just say this is at most 3n squared. OK, we're not going to really bother to save this minus 2n. Great, and now we can plug that into here. And something pretty good happens. We get that uh, the probability that the absolute value of x is at least t is at most 3n squared over n uh, squared t to the fourth, which is 3 over t to the fourth. And how do we use Chebyshev? If you remember, we would have got like 1 over t squared. OK, so assuming t is large, I mean, this is like 1 over t to the fourth, a constant over t to the fourth. Chebyshev is constant over t squared, so that's a lot better. And in general, you know, if we cared about the specific number 10 root ln n for t, OK, then we would get like a constant over log squared n for our bound, which is better than constant over n. Yep, log n. So in this case, if I don't care about the force moment, but do it with higher moments, will I get better bounds? Yes, if you do it with better, higher moments, you'll get even better bounds. Uh, but like the computations will become more annoying unless you do them in a slick way, which we we'll probably will eventually do. Uh, but you could do them. I mean, you could tough them out. You're tough, tough people. And if you keep going and use like the, the sixth moment method or whatever, uh, by the way, we always use even powers because, um, well, to do this, it's not a good idea to use an odd degree polynomial because you won't be able to keep it above the step function everywhere. So you'll want to use an even power. And it's a fact that uh, expected value, in this case, of x to the 2s 
when uh, s is like a natural number, is um, at most, well, it's something like n to the s. But there's a constant out front, which is the annoying thing uh, that depends on s. Like here it was like 3. This computation we just did with s equals 2. And we got this constant to be like 3. Uh, when you can plug it in, and you can therefore deduce that the probability that x is at least uh, t root n is at most this constant depending on s over t to the 2s. And then if you like heroically like got a good handle on this constant, then you can try to optimize s as a function of t. Because this gets better the bigger s is, but this constant also gets bigger the bigger s is. So you can optimize over s. And if you do that, uh, it'll ultimately work out great, and you'll get something that's basically the same as turn off bounds. Uh, but it's a pain, and now we'll show you the turn off bounds, which is like a different slick way to do something like this. Okay, let's erase this disgusting stuff. Okay, so. Uh, Turn off bounds is going to, again, be just like this. But we're going to use, a, as I sort of said at the beginning, like an exponential function to, instead of like this cortex. Let me erase this so it doesn't look so strange. Uh, and it's going to be uh, convenient in the turn off bounds to only worry about the probability that the random variable is way bigger than its expectation. You can do the analogous thing to worry about the probability it's way less than its expectation. Which means that uh, we're going to just think of um, this scenario. Let's put t here. And let's let f of t be this step function, which is 0 all the way out to t. And then it's 1 when x is bigger than t. And this curve that we're going to put above this is going to look like something like e to the x. So we could take um, this curve. It's no longer part of a quartic polynomial. It's going to be like g of x equals, we could take it to be like e to the x. And then in order to make it like match equal 1 at x equals t, we would divide by e to the t. Um, but it's actually better to be more flexible and just say like, well, I'm going to take g to be like some constant to the x, not necessarily e to the x. And one way you can do that is, Stick with e in the base, but just write e to the lambda x, where you're like lambda is a parameter I'll name later. OK, so we're going to do this whole trick. Uh, it's still set up for any lambda. Lambda is positive. So that we have like an exponential-like function divided by a constant. Sorry, this should be t. Uh, and it's set up so that they match at t equals x. They're both 1. And now we're going to use like. Uh, a Markov like trick. OK, so actually, just so I don't mess this up, let me call this u instead of t. So I'm going to focus just literally on this random variable, x, which is the sum of these plus or minus ones that are independent. Uh, the turn off bounds are more general than this. And I'm going to say, OK, the event that x is at least u is equivalent to the event that e to the lambda x is at least e to the lambda u. OK, that's because e to the power of something is an increasing function. I guess I'm not exactly using this picture. I'm doing like the Markov version of this argument. but. Anyway, I think this picture helps. Uh, OK, and so therefore, also this is a non-negative random variable, so we can use Markov. So Markov implies that the probability that this non-negative random variable is at least this number, e to the lambda u, is at most the expectation of the random variable, e to the lambda x divided by the number. 
e to the lambda u. Okay, let me just make clear what's going on here, because I think I didn't explain it perfectly. We have this random variable x, and we have some fixed number u, and we care about what's the probability that x exceeds this u. Okay, and we're saying that's the same event as this, which looks a little bit weird, but it's a trick. And we're going to use Markov's inequality to bound the probability of this happening. And lambda is like a free parameter, which I stuck in here. I'm going to choose it advantageously later. And it's going to depend on you. Yep? So for Markov's and Chevy Chev, we needed to know one thing about a random variable, and we needed two things. And for this one, we're going to need to know everything. Well, the thing that's going to happen just now is, um, so far, we haven't, this is true for any random variable at all. Even it doesn't have to be non-negative, nothing. But the, the thing that we are going to use heavily in just a second <laughs> to analyze this is the fact that the xi's are independent. And then we're also going to use the fact that we know everything there is to know, or we have good control over the xi's themselves. But in this case, they're very simple random variables. But indeed, uh, we're going to use the independence heavily in just a second, because this quantity is, uh, this is actually, it's maybe not so easy to tell. This is a function of lambda for x fixed. And it's called the moment generating function of the random variable x. Because if you differentiate this function like k times, you can easily extract the kth moment of the random variable x for any random variable x. Um, so this trick of looking at e to the lambda x in expectation is a known trick in probability. And what's great is that this thing is easy to compute using the fact that uh, it's this, x is the sum of independent random variables. So their plan is to compute that and then just choose lambda effectively to make this right-hand side small. Uh, OK. So again, I guess we'll do a big old calculation on this board. But this one is sort of entertaining. Uh, OK. So expected value of e to the lambda x is expected value of e to the lambda x1 plus lambda x2 plus dot 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 plus lambda xn. I should really switch to this exp notation so they don't have this, uh, have to write everything in the subscripts. Uh, OK, so this is. You know, by the properties of exponentiation, this is expected value of x of lambda x1 times uh, e to the lambda xn. OK, and now here we will crucially use the independence. Because all these random variables are independent, x1 through xn, so too are the random variables e to the lambda x1 through e to the lambda xn. And therefore, we can uh, say that the expectation of a product is the product of the expectations. So this is uh, expectation of x lambda x1 times expectation of x lambda xn. OK, and now uh, these are n numbers we're multiplying together. And they're all the same number because of the fact that uh, all these xi's have the same distribution. They're all just plus or minus one random variables. OK, so we can just say this is equal to, let's say, expected value of e to the lambda x1, the first such number, to the power of n. OK, so that's stage one. And now we'll literally explicitly kind of compute this as a function of lambda. So let's do that down here. Expected value of e to the lambda x1, say, uh, well, literally half the time x1 is 1, so we got half e to the lambda, and half the time it's minus 1, so we got half e to the minus lambda. Uh, some nerds would say this is like cosh lambda or something, but let's just um, use the Taylor expansion of e to the lambda. So this is like 1 plus lambda plus lambda squared over 2 plus lambda cubed over 3 factorial plus dot 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 
plus 1 minus lambda plus lambda squared over 2 factorial minus lambda cubed over 3 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Oh, times halves. So it's the average of these two things. OK, and that's cute because the odd powers cancel. And the even powers are the same. So this is just the even powers. 1 plus lambda squared over 2 factorial plus lambda fourth over 4 factorial plus dot, 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 dot. OK, and now here's the one like slightly weird move. I claim that this is at most e to the lambda squared over 2. And why is this claim true? Well, I'm going to write the Taylor series for this thing down here. It's 1 plus, the first term is lambda squared over 2. It's looking good. The next term is like lambda squared over 2 squared. So lambda the fourth over 2 squared times 2 factorial. Uh, and so far, it's bigger, right? Because here, the denominator is bigger than this denominator. Because this is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This is 2 times 2 times 2 times 1. Let's just do one more term. Lambda 6 over 6 factorial. And the next thing we'll get here is lambda squared cubed, which is lambda 6 over 2 cubed to 3 factorial. And again, here the denominator is bigger. It's 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 1. So it's going to be fine, right? I mean, that's true. So that shows the claim. And we did it. Uh, well, we bounded in a nice way this quantity. So we can put that back into the top right corner and get, therefore, expected value of e to the lambda x is at most the nth power of that, which is e to the lambda squared n over 2. Now we can put this into that. You can get, therefore, the probability that x is at least u. It's the same as the probability that e to lambda x is at least e to lambda u. And we use Markov. The numerator here is at most e to the lambda squared n over 2. The denominator is e to the lambda u. Great. So this is a true fact about every real number lambda. Maybe lambda should be positive, actually. Uh, and so we can choose our favorite lambda to try to make this as small as possible. So we want to minimize this as a function of u and n. And that's a very small exercise uh, for you. The best lambda is u over n. And now if you plug in u over n, you get that this is e to the minus u squared over 2n. OK, so this box we'll put here, and this box we'll put here. So it was some work, but we got a real great bound. Because this is like exponentially small once u gets bigger than root n. But like root n is the standard deviation here, so that's to be expected. So for example, with this bound we just finished doing, if we take u to be 10 uh, root ln n times root n, we get probability that absolute value of x is at least uh, this. Sorry, just that x is at least this. Uh, 10 root ln n root n is at most exactly the thing that was supposed to be, 1 over n to the 50. 